Welcome back to Radio Rothbard. I'm Ryan McMakin, executive editor at the Mises Institute. And with me is my co-host, Tho Bishop. But we also have economist, historian, Patrick Newman, closely associated with us here at the Mises Institute. And um, we're fortunate to have him back to talk a little bit about the economic history that he writes. And we're going to talk about uh, economic history just in general, and, and just history is a larger topic, and the importance of revisionism and historical revisionism. Now, Patrick, as you know, uh, hopefully, wrote a book called Cronyism, and this is pretty lengthy historical work. I remember when I saw the book, Tom Woods was standing near me, and I hadn't seen the book before, and I looked at the book, and I, and I saw that it covered like 300 years, and I made some comment about how that's that's a whole lot of history to cover in a, <laughs> in a book, because uh, I have never attempted such a broad uh, uh, period. But uh, you have a sequel to this book coming up, and we're going to talk uh, about things in light of that to some extent. And this is Cronyism Part 2, Rise of the Corporatist State, 1849 to 1929. And uh, obviously, there's a lot to cover in that time period, too, in terms of uh, crony capitalism, as we now call it, something of a misnomer, I suppose. Uh, but cronyism, certainly, as the title might suggest, is an important topic because it's very important to keep focused on the many ways that the state allies itself with large corporate interests, because there's so often we encounter this sort of myth and, I don't know, misconception that uh, capitalists, that is, people who support laissez-faire, just naturally ally with whatever it is that makes big business do well. Uh, but this is quite different from actual laissez-faire. And that's an important thing to keep track of, and also just looking at that in terms of the larger historical narrative about laissez-faire, about the Industrial Revolution, all those sorts of things are important in really understanding what is the true role of uh, the free market party, that is us, in all of that. But though I hear there's, I mean, this book has not yet been published yet. And so apparently we're in that, we're in those late stages of putting together a book where people can become involved as patrons, right? Absolutely. And of course, this book is being published by the Mises Institute, like the first one was. So if you would like to be a patron, if you'd like to put this book out in front of the masses, you can do so by donating at Mises.org slash cronyism2. That is the number two. We'll have a link in the show notes. Also, if you've not yet got your copy of Cronyism, Liberty versus Power in Early America, 1607 to 1849, you can get a physical copy at the Mises Bookstore if you use promo code ROTHPOD, R-O-T-H-P-O-D. There is a discount there. It's also free on Mises.org. And if you prefer your consumption in podcast form, Patrick and I did a mini-series based off of that great book, Liberty Versus Power, which you can find at the Mises Media page, and we'll have a link to that as well. Now, Patrick, you are an economist for the most part. Uh, you teach economics uh, in Florida. It says here in your bio at the University of Tampa. Is that still accurate? Yeah, University of Tampa. All right. And you teach economics. And however, some of your work, a lot of your work in recent years has been on this topic of economic history, which is a little different. And so what is it then that really has impelled you to to go back to this issue of economic history and, and really look at uh, this topic in light of your experience as an economist? Yeah, so I've, I've, I've been interested in economics basically since uh, Austrian economics, really, and uh, since uh, Ron Paul um, and, and the financial crisis of 2008. Uh, but before then, I've been I was always interested in history, a lot of times of war, like World War Two. And anyway, when I, my focus sort of shifted more to economics, I, I still retained um, an interest in history. It just became economic history. And I, I really think that the, the two disciplines are, are linked because a lot of times people just think economics is sort of abstract theory or even discussing current events. 
uh, when in reality, uh, history is, is, is very important because history can illustrate the economic theories. The economic theories explain the history, and then the history can be used to provide examples of theory. And this is especially important for Austrian economists and just people in favor of the free market because you could teach them all the theory in the world, but they're, they you know, could teach people all the theory in the world, the public, but a lot of times they want historical examples, especially because they were taught in their high school or in college that, you know, the Industrial Revolution was, you know, led to problems X, Y, and Z, and that you needed the government. You, you, you can't have a world without central banks because you'll just have these business cycles and these long depressions and so on. And, and people want history. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there, there's not a lot of examples of uh, the free market in you know the 21st century, right? So you have to go back to periods where there really there was much less government to provide examples of okay, here's how economies recovered in the absence of a central bank activist policy, or here's how living standards actually rose during the industrial revolution, or you know th these so-called big businesses, these big businesses, they never achieved these monopolies. In fact. Uh, you know, there was always new competition or prices were falling, the quality of products were increasing and, and, and so on. So people need these examples. And I think it's very helpful. I think it's the, the task of um, an economist to sort of move into history because a lot of times historians don't know economics, right? And they would do, do explain to sort of present an accurate view of what actually happened in the past because that informs people about, okay, what could work in the present slash the future. And I guess on cronyism in particular, it's very important because people, they, they, they think that all these policies are, you know, government policies, they are intended to benefit the public interest. That's what the politicians say, you know, that, that's, that's, their, that's their campaign slogans and so on. And in, in, you know, in reality, the, it, it, these, these, these laws, these rules, these regulations are intended to, pa to benefit special interests. And it's very helpful, I think, to sort of present sort of a, a long list from the, you know, my, my goal is from the country's founding up to the present, I'd like to get to the present, of showing how politicians have said one thing, but they've done another. In fact, special interests, they, they sort of rule the, the legislative process. These laws benefit special interests and they fight over how they're going to benefit from them, who gets the benefits and so on. And I just think this is uh, you know, all good economic historians. I think at some point they need to deal with cronyism and special interest policies because that's actually how, you know, the motivation behind legislation. And that was actually the, their, their effects as well. Well, and Ralph Rako was often cognizant of, he was a historian. Um, and in fact, while I mention him, I should note that uh, part of the reason we're talking about this also is that in addition to your book, early next year, we'll have a new book also that I'm editing by historian Ralph Rako about basically the history of, ec of uh, political thought, which covers a lot of these topics. And certainly the Industrial Revolution and a variety of war topics as well. And something that he always pointed out and uh, he was really drawing upon the work of F.A. Hayek, who had written some important uh, essays on the topic of how uh, history and the historians have affected views of economics. And this is what Ralph says to have about it. He says, it's a curious fact that of all the disciplines, it seems that history, more than philosophy or economics, determines people's political views. We might consider this unfair. We might think that e economics has more to say about what people should think about competition and antitrust. Philosophy has more to say about what people should think about natural rights. But in fact, most often it seems that it's history or interpretations of history that will influence the positions that people take. And this goes back to what you were just saying, Patrick, right? People, they want to know the history because they were taught something in grade school that gave them a certain view of laissez-faire or the industrial revolution or or free markets or whatever and so we encounter this all the time you might be mentioning some economic theory and then the comeback is yes but what about that historical period that proves that markets don't work 
And so then you have to be ready with information about what really happened in that historical period. And I mean, the Great Depression, we're still fighting about all of these decades later about what actually caused it and what were the underlying issues behind the money supply and all that sort of stuff thing in the 1920s. That's why Rothbard's work of economic history, America's Great Depression, is so important. It's because what Ralph is saying here is that without those sorts of examples, without what is essentially empirical work, right? You have people, they're going back and they're, they're researching old facts about how the economy functioned in time period X. They're providing those examples that we believe show, of course, the accuracy of our own theories from the Austrian school. We don't see any conflict there at all. We think this history bears out what Austrian theory tells us. But yeah, people want those examples. And I encounter this, of course, still from people who will read our articles. There's this weird misconception, I'm sure you've heard it too, is, hey, I thought I'll write an article that say covers uh, some, I might even like riff on something Rothbard wrote about the money supply in the 20s. Well, I write all these money supply articles, right? What did the money supply do last month? What did it do 10 years ago? What did it do in 1929? All of that's history, right? Just because it happened last month doesn't mean it's not history. And But then you get people come back and say, hey, I thought you people were Austrians and you didn't believe in looking at any numbers of anything as if... Well, I'm an Austrian. I don't care what the temperature is outside today. I'm just going to use philosophical notions to, to uh, determine what the weather is. I mean, that's absurd. Austrians don't believe anything like that. Uh, but you encounter that all the time, even though, of course, Mises's work is just absolutely permeated by history and historical examples. So it's everywhere in Austrian's work, even though we get accused of never using any empirical data or historical data, real world examples. We do it all the time, and part of the reason we do it is because people make up their minds so much, so often ideologically, based on these sorts of examples uh, from the past. So it's always just so important to cover that. So I'm, I'm glad that we have economists, professional economists, who are doing the trouble of learning how to write history, which is its own problem. It's its own skill you have to figure out. Because, as you say, right, relying on historians to provide good economic theory into their historical works is not necessarily something you should assume is going to happen, because there's often a lot of shortcomings there. But at the Mises Institute, we're just trying to always add to that. And your book is just, of course, one recent example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with, uh, with what you said. The, Murray Rothbard would uh, quipped, um, there's a series of lectures that he gave on economic history for a class he taught at Brooklyn Polytech in the, in the 1980s, and he started off the, uh, the course, really, by saying the problem with most economic historians is that half of them are economists who don't know any history, and the other half are historians who don't know any economics, right? And that's, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pervasive problem, and, and it's unfortunate because history often gets neglected I mean, you know, it, it's 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 not as looked as highly upon as say economics or even say doing current events work or you know some something like that. But uh, history, the, the history is how people shape their minds because for a lot of people, economics, economic theory is very abstract. It's hard to understand. It's very boring. In their own views of what's happening in current events, are shaped by what they've learned either in books or on podcasts or on articles, or really they just remember from high school about uh, you know, X, Y, and Z, whether it's the, um, you know, again, the, 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 the Russia-Ukraine war. And then while that brings in, um, you know, what well, you know, people compare Putin to Hitler or things like that, or other types of conflicts, or, uh, you know, we have uh, the financial crisis, well, we have to engage in government interventions X, Y, and Z, because then that will, otherwise we'll have the Great Depression, or we need the government to regulate uh, medical care or regulate the, the quality of food and so on, or else We'll have Upton Sinclair's *The Jungle* and 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 you know rats falling into and, and, and you know humans falling into into vats and rats climbing on meat and all this stuff and it's it's really important because uh, you know, that's how you sort of win the the the, the long run battle for ideas is, is by accumulating empirical evidence. Aust Austrians are not against empirical evidence; they're just saying empirical evidence cannot test the theory, right? The theory of the market or the market process is not tested by any sort of particular time period in which there were markets and there was 
entrepreneurs and stuff. It's something that can be deduced from um, self-evident axioms and, 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 and basic assumptions. And, and then it's applied to, uh, to, by the historian to understand what's going on. And, and this task is, is very important because most people, myself included, are not going to develop economic theory or some new way of of deriving, you know, a demand curve or talking about the structure of production. It's really just by about applying uh, theories that have already been discovered and proven to new case studies. And that includes current events, but it especially includes the past where as libertarians, we, we need to go back to the past because those are when we can get some clear examples. And, and a lot of those examples still rule the public's perception of how the world works. And that includes the fact that, well, you need government to make things better off. Yeah, politicians uh, are looking to benefit the public. It's only businesses that are self-interested. And you know, various laws came about through the that was due to the public interest motivation. And and you know, I, I just want to stress this point because uh, history, as 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 you know, uh, is, is is just so crucial. And I think very often uh, that 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 gets lost uh, on people because you, you need history in order to persuade people. And I think about when I think about the importance of economic history and revisionism and this kind of broader battle of ideas. And someone who I usually do not quote very favorably, but who has a, a quote that I always thought is particularly relevant to the importance of this is old Eleanor Roosevelt with her quip about how, you know, great minds talk about ideas, average minds discuss events, and small minds discuss people. And it's like, we can talk about theory, great minds can talk about theory, but in order to communicate these ideas to the larger public, whether they be average minds or, or small minds, in her words, um, you know, th this is where the narrative aspect of history is so important. And one of the things I loved about the first cronyism, something that was a big aspect, and I think, you know, why Rothbard's histories were always so engaging, is that it's not only providing a different perspective on these broader events, but you know, there, there's a lot of names, you know, naming names yeah, yeah, yeah. in these things. You know, and, and, we, and what, we, what we build from that, right, is that the, the state, the regime is so powerful, the mainstream narrative is so powerful because you have, you got your white hats, you got your black hats, right? You got George Washington, you know, you've, you've got your, 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 your Hitler on the other side, right? And you've got your heroes, you got your villains. And with, with your first, first book, right, you know, some of the, the villains, some of our favorite punching bags, right, Alexander Hamilton and John Marshall and Henry Clay and, and that whole side of the aisle. And then when, it, when we were looking for good um, kind of libertarian pushback from that, right, you know, there's Jeffersonians more than just Jefferson, but the various Jeffersonian thinkers, the various Jacksonian thinkers bigger than just simply Jackson. And so moving into to cronyism too, or the, the, in your second book, Kind of just just for our audience, what are some of the the kind of interesting heroes and villains here? Because one of the things I'm reading an early draft that you sent, um, you you mentioned how kind of you know within within cronyism the first one right we have this kind of clear ideological divide between you know the, the Hamiltonians and the Jeffersonians just to, to simplify it, but this sort of ideological divide starts getting eroded into sort of these, these different power, you know, these different special interest groups going up against each other. And there, there seems like there's fewer, his, fewer heroes as, as this economic narrative goes on. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we're talking about this kind of broader conversation about historical revisionism and, and the importance of this work, what, what are some, some perhaps particular figures within this sort of unique period of time? Again, I think this is probably one of the more neglected ones besides the Civil War aspect of it. What, what are some figures that listeners might be interested in introducing themselves that they may not uh, understand either for, for good or for evil? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point though. And I think you mentioning when you talk about the libertarian heroes sort of of the past, you know, one of the other important parts of history, and I'll, 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 I'll just wanna say this, is that we can learn about strategy, right? How did people actually reform things? How did the Jacksonian or the Jeffersonians get things done, what worked, what didn't, you know, and, 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 and that's, very, that's very important. In the first book, I stress a lot the, the power of the executive veto and how that was used to attack cronyism. And, and unfortunately, I couldn't call this book Liberty Versus Power Part Two uh, because there wasn't a really a, a, a libertarian political party or mass movement on the same level of the Jeffersonian Republicans 
for the Jacksonian Democrats. After 1849, it basically became split or right around in, in the late 1840s due to the controversy over expanding slavery into the Western territories. And you kind of had these two pro-power parties, basically. And it's more or less been the same since then. We've had these periods where after the Civil War, you had the Bourbon Democrats of Grover Cleveland. So these free market Democrats, Sam Tilden was also another one. I know, I know My he's man. a, he, you're, you're, you're a fan of him. And, and they, they kind of, they're, they're, there's been great work done tracing the influence of them back to say uh, the Jacksonians. And you can see this thread of continuity between Jefferson, Jackson, Cleveland. Unfortunately, though, by the time of Cleveland, it gets weaker. Uh, Cleveland won two terms, but they were non-consecutive, right? It couldn't even sort of maintain um, the power, you know, over an eight-year period, which does uh, which does say something. And uh, yeah, you do. Unfortunately, you see less heroes. And for example, I, I like Cleveland. I'll be honest with you, on my wall right over there, I have two pictures of presidents from the early 1900s. I have one of Martin Van Buren, and I have one of Grover Cleveland, right? So I, 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 like, I like Grover Cleveland, and I think he did, did, did some good stuff in office. Unfortunately, though, um, it, it wasn't enough, or he wasn't able to sort of fight some of the pressures that he was facing, whether they were from Wall Street bankers or just from his own party or even railroads. And so he, he's sort of a, a mixed hero. And that's that's also Rothbard's assessment because Grover Cleveland, in between his uh, his candidacies, in between when he was uh, when he was president, he, he worked at um, the same law firm as Francis Lynn Stetson, who was J.P. Morgan's attorney. Right. So there was kind of like that link there in, in Morgan, New Cleveland uh, closely. And and uh, you know, Cleveland, Cleveland's great. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't it wasn't good enough. And and you can make this argument that this is partially why the Bourbon Democrats were not able to really maintain the same level of power as the Jeffersonians or the or the Jacksonians or at least political influence. And really, you just see more villains in, in this book, unfortunately. Uh, you see lots of villains and you see people who uh, we know are villains, but then you see people who we people might not think actually are villains, but there's some special interest motivation behind them. I, I place a lot of, I stress J.P. Morgan a lot in Wall Street, right? So Wall Street kind of comes off as sort of uh, the bad guys uh, or the, the the main bad guys. So um, uh, investment, by yeah, that. investment bankers uh, do not fare well. So investment bankers probably not going to uh, have too many uh, fan letters from them, whether, uh, you know, again, starting off with Jay Cook prominent Civil War investment banker or J.P. Morgan. Um, you know, they're often in favor of special interest policies, government regulations that are supporting the the um, cartelizing the businesses they're trying to finance, so you know, trying to restrict market entry. Um, and then there's also other people who a lot of people don't know about. So say Harvey Washington Wiley, who was head of the Bureau of Chemistry. This is what became the Food and Drug Administration. I talk about some of his personal um, motivations for food and drug legislation, which was to enrich some of the companies he was invested in, as well as to increase his own power. Ida Tarbell, uh, who's a famous muckraker uh, against uh, Standard Oil, uh, well, a lot of people don't know that her brother and her family was uh, um, they, they worked for one of Standard Oil's competitors that they drove out, Standard Oil drove out of business. Right. And there's a lot of stuff, a lot of examples of lawyers who Lou, Lou, uh, Louis Brandeis, so the people's lawyer um, who was really just a. Uh, financed by shippers, or we go into the American Medical Association and we talk about uh, the, the, the efforts of doctors to sort of cartelize the medical industry and the in the university accreditation system for for, for medical universities. And there, there's there's lots of examples, and un, unfortunately, it's it's mainly just bad guys. Um, in, in 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 this I mean, in this in, in in this series, and I think it's also true as we move forward to the next leg of history where it's, you know, you see some periods of uh, libertarian resurgence, maybe among the old right, but even then, again, it's still a minority in a political party, and it's only kind of fleeting. It's, it's not big enough to really um, uh, enact sort of long-lasting reform. So this, this book, uh, there's, there's, there's got plenty of villains, and there's villains for everyone. <laughs> 
I guess that's what I'll say. Well, that that is an important part, I think, of the, the history we write as well, is just providing people with some knowledge about who the good guys were, because you're not going to encounter any of these people uh, during your grade school history class from a free market perspective in terms of this person was good because they were a free market guy, right? That's You're not going to get that in any of these classes. And you might hear about some of the good guys, but it's, it's not going to be for any reason that was actually good. Uh, it might be for, right, we all hear about Andrew Jackson, mostly for his worst stuff, like uh, the, <laughs> the removal of the Cherokee Indians and things like that, right? Just mm -hmm. his most unlibertarian acts. But we never hear about, right, his war against the, the bank and things like that in normal grade school history classes or high school or college or any of that sort of thing. So this narrative has to be really constructed often from very little uh, in terms of where are we getting the history. Although there are certainly some, I haven't read your book and we'll need to cover it in more detail after it comes out, but I've certainly been influenced by mostly left-wing writers on things like that. Guys like Gabriel Kolko, who talked about, right, the role of the imperialist state in uh, the Gilded Age stuff, right? And, but then, of course, the, the, the standard narrative is that Theodore Roosevelt was the good guy there, even though uh, we, all, we always conveniently forget TR's horrible racism and imperialism and, just think, and we just hear about how he wanted to help the poor with his anti-trust stuff. And, and so all, that's just all just such a horrible muddle of things that is never ordered into any kind of real understanding of these events. And it makes me think of, though, how often, how little understanding there is of, among even our readers and our people, among the work that has to go into this in terms of writing this better history, because I've received many emails over the years, usually from older people, who talk about how, well, we just need to tell history as it really was and not this fake version of history that the leftists write. They have this idea that uh, it's self-evident what the correct telling of history is, and that if you just, you just tell all the facts, that it will be clear that our side was right. Of course, Mises pointed this out, right? He's like, how do you tell all the facts? I, you would, I'm just going to go and relate everything that happened in the year 1880? Uh, that, would, that would be history, but it would be useless history. The, the challenge of the story is to bring to, to forward the relevant facts, Mises says. And so that's the challenge we face, is what are the relevant facts and what are we pointing to that illustrates uh, the things that people on our side should know about history so that they actually have the good examples and they know maybe for their own future research who were, who were the people that we should look into in more detail, who were the people who had some good thoughts, and, uh, you know, we should defend, of course, Cleveland, who was by no means perfect. But, boy, if Cleveland were running for office today, it would be considered some sort of crazed, out-there, libertarian guy. And I was reminded of this recently. I, I, uh, a few months ago, when we were in Houston for an event, I visited Ron Paul's house for the first time ever. I had never been there. And I was, so I was looking around his room or his office, right? Big, big thing of Grover Cleveland. So he's also a confirmed Grover Cleveland fan. And it's because of these issues of just any attempts to really restrain the state. He was also a good anti-imperialist. He was good on trade, of course, and even on, uh, he was a real minimalist in terms of regulating immigration even back then, uh, which was becoming heavily federalized at the time. And uh, so many of those details are just simply ignored. You just never encounter them. And uh, th unfortunately, we're left, as you say, clinging to just a small number of people who are the good guys. And, and who are we left with then, right? Uh, the old right. I mean, there's just so, there's just not much there unless you start to delve much more deeply into what's available. And if you're just going on your mainstream college education, you're not going to know any of this information. So it's really up to us to relate this stuff to our readers and to anyone who's interested. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I, I, I agree completely. I, I think I think a lot of times 
the task of the historian is presented as as much easier than what it actually is. Like just present the 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 facts, right? Or just present sort of the 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 narrative that's um, that that we 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 know to be true or something something along those lines. And and it, it's it's more complicated than that. There's there's a lot of research involved. There's a lot of reading. There's sometimes, of course. Uh, new criticisms that get brought up to say, oh, actually, you know, f- uh, food safety wasn't that safe in the Gilded Age or the Industrial Revolution made people poor. We're able to see this by looking at average heights of people. And then it gets into this whole battle. And there's obviously a, a, a structure of production, so to speak, for, for these types of ideas. You could have popular historians that use the work of more specialized historians. And then you have people who are literally going to archives and digging things up and and so on. And, and I, I think you have this process to, uh, it, it's involved to tell the history as sort of it actually happened, right? Which is, of course, you need a certain perspective for that. But the, uh, the, the naming names, I think, is very, very important. And that's something that Rothbard always tried to do, his power elite analysis in his various histories. And I've tried to do that as well. I can only imagine how difficult it was for him before the internet when if you wanted to learn about something, you had to only read a book or you had to go to a library to see if books were there or get something through interlibrary loan. I mean, I do that still, but I mean, it's there, there's so many resources online and ability to look at books much quicker and search engines and all of this stuff because you, to really kind of construct this narrative of showing, okay, here's how these people benefited, here's who they spoke to, here's their financial interest and so on. It takes a lot of work. And then there's the battle of actually using this to convince people, right? You can write about something, but if it gets no one, no one, no one reads it or something, then, then what's the point? You, you then have to find a way of digesting it into a, into a format that's um, easier for people to understand, uh, whether that's a book or that's an article or a podcast or lectures or, or, or something like that. And uh, then at the end of the day, you're going to hope some people will will sort of learn, under, improve, revise their, ver- their, their their historical priors, we could say, and then maybe be able to tell other people about it, explain it to other people, and and so on, because that's that's sort of the, the the larger battle, you could say, we're all engaged in. In in the in the history, I think is absolutely crucial for Austrian economics, for libertarians, and so on. And it's, it, it includes everything from the country's founding to everything up to yesterday, right? And it's, it's a constant process of just applying theories and using uh, historical episodes as, 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 as illustrations of, of said theories. And a lot of times, is of course, as, as Austrians and, and libertarians, the, the history is revisionist, right? Because we are revising the standard narrative whether about a war or whether about a business cycle or about even economic growth or, or something like that. You know, virtually all of the history is revisionist. We don't say, oh, yeah, that thing you learned in college or that thing you learned in, um, you know, on, on the news. Oh, yeah, that was right. Right. You know, and then we close, we end. And then, you know, we, 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 we close the book and you end, you go like, OK, all right, it's done. It, it, it's it's much more involved. It's it's a lot of times when, you know, people telling me they read cronyism or something else I've written or even, you know, Rothbard, what they, they've read from Rothbard. They say, I never even knew half of these people existed. Right. And that's that's sort of the shame because they get lost in the presentation of history by the in the like the mainstream narrative right they these people get lost their motivations get lost and your uh, the the history that's that, that you learn or that people learn is is um uh, uh is is very simplified let's say right and that's that's the job of of uh historians to 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 to, to explain the history um and, and present it in a way that people could understand and, and part of that simplified narrative is that, and, and we find this all the time even within our circles, right, is that when we think about the big villains, or even to a certain case, some of the heroes, right, we tend to focus on presidents, right? We, we tend to focus on politicians. We tend to focus on kind of the obvious names, and we kind of decide, you know, there and there, okay, well, you know, Lincoln bad, Jefferson good, right? We kind of focus on the political class. And again, I think that's another very interesting aspect of your work in this period, and Rothbard also did... Uh, you know, focus on a lot of this aspect as well. Again, I think he has a great quote in um, 
uh, uh, origins of the, the Federal Reserve, right, about how like, the entire history of uh, 20th century politics up to World War II, right, is really about the Rockefellers versus the Morgans. And, and it's these, these financial interests, it's these cronyist interests that transcend political parties, they transcend what is perceived as political divides because politics becomes so intertwined with the economy, or perhaps vice versa there, that, that these ideological divides become less important than these special interest dynamics there. And just for just a little bit for our audience, can you just talk about, because you know this is still very relevant to how things are now. I think this is why you have contemporary interests so high on things like the World Economic Forum and Davos, Right, Ryan's written a great deal about financialization, and obviously we, you know, we can talk about Goldman Sachs and kind of the major financial powers there and the way that it doesn't matter who wins the White House, right? You end up still getting some Goldman Sachs guys in charge of the Treasury and all that sort of fun stuff, right? So can you just talk a little bit about how kind of this, this escalation of you know, these, these, these you know, nominally private actors, how, how their influence kind of overtakes anything resembling sort of political divides and kind of, because like this seems like the period where again, any sort of ideological divide in politics completely breaks down and it's all just who can control the most pieces on the board to make sure that their interest groups, that their financial interests are best represented and you know, at, at times crushing whoever their, their economic opponents are, whatever their, their rivals are. Can you just talk a little bit about, about you know, that process generally um, because I think that's such a fa fascinating aspect of this narrative, and which again is only done through you know, kind of this is this is a revisionist look at this period. Like this is the sort of in the weeds stuff that you can only kind of get through a, a true economic lens. Yeah. So Rothbard w would sometimes joke that when, when discussing the say a, a cabinet, uh, a secretary, a uh, cabinet position, or sec you know the secretary of war, or secretary of the treasury, or something like that, or really a congressman, or or president and, and, and so on, and everyone from the top to the bottom, uh, we, we, we tend to think that these people don't have lives, right? They just appear out of nowhere and they serve office for four to eight years or something and then, and then they're gone, right? They, they, they're, they're, they just come out like a, like, like a, like a comet and then they're, they're here, they benefit the public and then they leave, right? And then we focus on the next person. But as he would say, these people have lives. They came from some, I mean, occupation they had before, they had, uh, you know, after, they might have had during or at least one of their family members or their relatives or a business partner or so on. And, and we, have to, we have to look at that. And when we do look at that, we are able to create we're able to detect these patterns that you've mentioned of financial interests in, say, both political parties or financial interests exerting control or really rival financial interests or rival sort of special interest groups. And, and, and we, we, we tend to see a history less as one party versus another party, but instead uh, various groups kind of fighting for the spoils, so to speak. Uh, whether rival big businesses or rival small businesses or big businesses versus small businesses and so on. And we really kind of see the actual sort of movers and shakers, the, the people who are really creating the policy and so on. And that these people who uh, you know, appear out of the blue and then they disappear, well, they're actually linked to some of these interests. And then we're able to connect um, the, 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 we're, we're able to connect the dots and, you know, this is a very difficult process because, you know, involves a lot of um, uh, involves a lot of reading and research and figuring out, OK, who people uh, were linked with. Of course, these hypotheses can get revised based on new archival sources or new evidence. And this can continue all the way to uh, the present. Right. This type of, uh, of, of revisionism, both for you know, his, historical figures in the past as well as the present. This is being done uh, constantly, but it still exists. This process still exists of these financial interests and other types of interests controlling things from behind the scenes. And I, it, I do think, it, as you mentioned, it, it really, I think, started after the Civil War because you don't have a strong enough opposition party and like an actual genuine opposition party, one in favor of liberty, one against cronyism, one against government power and so on, that was actually in favor of trying to reduce regulations, not just kind of a, a back and forth where we're going to be against what the other group says because we need to win office and we're going to just, you know, 
posture differently or, or, or something like that, which is what you've had for the better part of 100 years. Rothbard would say that the big um, dividing point was the election of 1896. And this is when Grover Cleveland, the Cleveland Democrats got kicked out of the of the democracy, so to speak. And William Jennings Bryan took over and both parties have been kind of similar ish since then. It goes through phases um, and a back and forth. But uh, the, it, 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 it's a task that needs to be done that revisionism is not just explaining, say, economic facts differently or saying there was growth when there wasn't growth or, well, wartime prosperity wasn't actually that prosperous. It's actually trying to show you know, who benefits from something, who actually pushed for a law, right? Who are the names? Who are the people? You got to name names. You got to explain uh, these people. You want to explain the backgrounds of various politicians and bureaucrats. And this is very important. And I'm hoping that the what I've presented in the in the second book from 1849 to 1929 is not just history for history's sake. Oh, this is interesting. Let's read about it. But much like the first book, there's stuff that we could we could we we, we can learn from uh, this historical period. We could try to apply it to the present to understand how financial interests overlap or how the, you know government policy is really made and 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 so on. And, and just you know to give one more example, uh, the the theme of the book is that. Basically, businesses couldn't monopolize and cartelize in the late 19th century. So then they turned to government to create barriers to entry, to restrict uh, price and product competition, all this stuff. The, the Gabriel Colco thesis, basically. Well, fast forward to the present, and what do people say we need to fight big business? The, biz the big businesses, of course, have changed. We're not dealing with standard oil anymore. We're dealing with mega businesses involved in AI or social media or uh, producing computer chips or cars or electric cars or something. But it's the same principles. The, the, the theory of the market hasn't changed. Right. And, and it, it, the same thing applies is that, well, actually, uh, how they're benefiting is f how they're getting these monopolies is from government regulation. And that when they are facing competitive pressures, they're actually not able to restrict supply. They have to lower price. They have to improve product quality and all this stuff. And this is most people won't get that just from the theory. They're going to say that's dogmatic. They need the history to be persuaded uh, that free competition can actually work. Well, if you made it this far in the podcast, you must be very interested in the topic of history and historical revisionism. So I just want to mention that uh, coming up at the Mises Institute, we have coming up uh, May 15th through May 17th next year, 2025, the a conference called the Revisionist History of War. And uh, this conference will we'll bring in all sorts of historians for this. And uh, we're going to cover modern wars, that's including Middle East stuff. We're not uh, shying away from that, but of course Ukraine, but of course all, all uh, wars of the past that we have any experts in the room that can cover. And uh, we'll have a lot of our people there, uh, as well as some people who aren't normally associated with us, but provide some good historical information. So if you're interested in this topic, put that now on uh, Save the Date, uh, May 15th through 17th next year. And with that, we'll just go ahead and wrap up this episode of Radio Rothbard. Thank you, Patrick Newman, uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Tho. We'll be back next time with more, so we'll see you then. <laughs>